Welcome to the Midweek Bible Study of New Salem Baptist Church. We're glad you joined us as we seek to deepen our understanding of the Bible, to develop as disciples of Jesus Christ, and to discover the unique role that God has for each of us in His amazing plan. And as always, if you are enjoying this material, please be sure to subscribe, to like, and to share with your friends. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a topic that a lot of people have questions about, knowing God's will. Uh, there's a story about an old Scottish woman who went from home to home across the countryside selling thread, buttons, and shoestrings. When she would come to an un unmarked crossroad, she would toss a stick into the air and go in whatever direction the stick pointed when it landed. One day, however, she was seen tossing the stick up in the air several times. And somebody who noticed this asked her and said, why do you keep throwing the stick up in the air. And she says, well, the stick keeps pointing to the left and I want to go to the right. How often do we treat God in exactly the same way? We say we want his guidance, but we keep throwing the stick up in the air until we get the answer we really want. Well, Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 shares a basic principle that is critically important to discerning what God's will actually is. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. The process of discovering God's will begins with exercising unreserved trust in Him. Uh, this is not a blind trust. We've been talking about this for the last few sessions. It's not a blind trust, but it's a trust-based upon our personal knowledge of God's faithfulness and His character. And that trust leads us to listen to and to obey God's Word as He's revealed it to us in the Bible. Trusting God means that when our perceptions, our desires, or our opinions contradict what God has disclosed expressly in His Word, then we consciously choose His direction over our own. And as we exercise trust in God, we also seek to acknowledge Him in every aspect of our lives. So let Jesus be Lord over that area of our life. That means we seek to bring our values, our decisions, and our activities into alignment with His authority and His principles. If we truly accept Jesus as Lord, there's no area of our lives that's segregated or separated out from His Lordship. Now, we do this all the time. We, we try to say, okay, God, you can have this room, that room, and that room over there, but I'm keeping this one right here for me. This is my space. Don't try to change it. It's like we allow God into part of our house, but we don't want to allow Him in the innermost places. The process of discipleship and sanctification, though, involves throwing open more of those rooms and inviting Him to come in and take over, yielding more and more of our lives over to Him. And if we want to discover God's will, then that's a necessary thing. If we're having difficulty in discerning what God's will is, then maybe we need to step back and ask ourselves a couple of questions. First of all, we need to ask, am I trusting in God's word over my own opinions? Or am I trying to force my opinions to shape that word? The other question we need to ask is, am I acknowledging his authority in each sphere of my life? That may be the hangup that's keeping us from seeing where God's trying to lead us. Now, as followers of Christ, our desire should be to understand God's will, not to run away from it, but to seek it and understand it. Ephesians 5.17 says, So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And when you think about it, it really would be foolish to try to live your life apart from an understanding of what our Creator intended. Most of us today have some kind of digital device, a phone or a tablet. If you're like me, you have both of them. Now, up until recently, most of these devices came with a warning. Do not immerse in water. Some of the newer ones are a little more resilient, but... Uh, how many of us have had the experience of dropping our phone into a puddle or a pool or something worse and then making the mad scramble to stuff into a bag of rice overnight in hopes that we can soak up any moisture that might cause the phone to short circuit? Now, imagine that you had a phone or a tablet like that that was not water resistant. And then let's say that what you really like to do was sit on a float in the pool to relax, but you also like to read on your tablet while you relax. Now, how smart would it be to take that device out on the float despite the manufacturer's warning? I mean, under those circumstances, whose fault would it be if something happened to your device? Would it be the manufacturer's or would it be yours? And yet, 
How often do we ignore God's recommendations and pursue things that he's warned us are not good for us? As Proverbs 19.3 tells us, the foolishness of man ruins his way and his heart rages against the Lord. We violate what God's told us to do. We go against it. We get in trouble. And what do we do? We shake our faces and say, God, why did you let this happen? The reality is, is that when we go against God's warnings and negative consequences result, that's on us, not him. Now, God promises that if we seek out his will, he will instruct us in the way that we should go. Psalm 32, verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. God's eye is always on you. He, he never loses you. He knows exactly where you're at, and he also knows where he wants to take you. And he is waiting for us to allow him to lead us in that direction. And God is much more reliable than any man-made GPS, let me tell you. Even You've had a GPS tell you to go the wrong way? Uh, a couple of years ago, we were on vacation in Florida, and we tried using the GPS to lead us to a, a particular mall that we wanted to visit. And we got to the intersection, and we could see the mall across the street, uh, and the GPS was telling us to make a left turn to enter the mall parking lot. There was only one problem. The cross street was a right turn only. To make it worse, that road went across a big bridge that went all the way across the bay. So if we turned right, we'd have to go all the way across the bay to the next town before we could turn around and come back. So uh, we had to backtrack on our own in an unfamiliar neighborhood until we find uh, found another cross street that allowed us to do what we needed to do. I've also told the story about the time that uh, we were trying to get to a friend's farm out in the country, and our GPS sent us to an empty field on the other side of the hill and told us to park and walk the rest of the way. GPS are wonderful devices most of the time, but they are not infallible. The same can be said for many of the other sources that we turn to for directions in life, including our own feelings or intuitions. Our hearts and our guts are not always the best guide for life. They can actually lead us astray more often than not. However, when we trust him, God will always lead us in the right direction. Now, what are some examples of areas where God has revealed his will for us? Well, in John 6, 40, Jesus said, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. The first and main thing that God wants from you is for you to put your faith in his Son, Jesus, and receive the gift of eternal life. Everything else flows from this faith relationship with Christ. If you haven't yet received Christ in your life as your Savior and your Lord, that's actually the first step to pursuing God's will for the rest of your life. And if you'd like to know more about what this means, please check out some of our previous videos or email me at pastor at newsalembaptist.net. We'd love to share more with you. Another way that God has revealed his will to us, another thing that God has revealed is his will for us, is found in 1 Peter 2.15, where we're told, For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. God's will for us is to do right. In other words, to live lives marked by righteousness and integrity. If we live above reproach, then we'll take away a lot of the ammo that our critics may try to use against us. As Proverbs 26.2 says, like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flying, so is a curse, a curse without cause does not alight. And let me tell you, I have seen that to be true. I like to paraphrase that and say, if you uh, you can, need to conduct yourself in such a way that when people do start to talk trash about you, nobody else is going to believe it. And I've seen that happen several times. Another way that God has revealed his will is in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18, which says, in everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God desires for us to live in an attitude of thanksgiving. And this involves thanking God in every situation in life, both good and the not so good. Well, pastor, how do you thank God in the not so good areas of life? Well, surely there's something you can find in whatever situation you're in to thank God for. Uh, even if you're undergoing tremendous pain and stress, think about this. Is your heart still beating? Thank God. Are your lungs still working? Thank God. You've still got hope. You've still got life. That is a start. Thank God for that. When we give thanks, we're reminding ourselves that everything we have is really dependent 
upon God's mercy and grace. So, so in anything you face in life, find a way to give thanks. And then another way that uh, another aspect of his will that God has expressed that he wants us to, to follow is 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. God's will is that we be sanctified. In other words, that we increasingly reflect the character of Jesus in our own character. We become like mirrors for his image. And Paul specifically points out one area in which this sanctification is expressed. It's in the area of sexual morality. And this is especially difficult in our hedonistic age, where sexual immorality is not only tolerated, but often celebrated. Followers of Christ are called to swim against the prevailing cultural tide in that area and to acknowledge God by obeying His commandments regarding sex. Do we listen to what the world tells us and adopt the world's values, or do we trust God enough to obey Him and, to, as hard as it may be, to follow Him in this area? Our attitude towards God's will shouldn't be one of resistance, but it should be one of delightful pursuit. Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Now, there's a lot in that short verse. Uh, I'm here to tell you, there's no more joyful place than to have assurance that you're following God's will. And there's no more miserable place than knowing that you're actually outside of God's will. Uh, one place I've seen this operate kind of clearly is when there's someone who's re actually wrestling with God's call in their life to some kind of ministry or service, and they're fighting it and resisting it. Some of the most miserable people I've ever met have been in that position. And some of them, a few of them actually later, would give into that call and surrender to it and begin pursuing it. And you run into them later and they are filled with joy and fulfillment because they finally found their niche. They finally found that part of God's plan that he designed for them. We, we talk about that every week, discovering the unique place God has for us in his plan. Well, uh, when you are in sync with that plan, then you get a sense of fulfillment and a sense of direction. But when you're resisting that leadership, man, that's a miserable place to be. If we truly love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then pursuing his will uh, for us is going to bring us that delight and fulfillment. Knowledge of God's will also does not come to us automatically. It's something that has to be pursued. Note the psalmist associates his delight in God's will with the fact he has hidden God's word in his heart. He has memorized and internalized and just soaked himself in that word. And that's something that requires intentionality, time, and effort. It doesn't happen automatically. Knowledge of God's will doesn't always come to us in complete form, but it's unveiled to us as we trust in and as we follow Jesus. Consider the words of Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now, I don't know how much time you spend out in the woods and where it's completely dark, trying to find your way along a trail. When I was younger, I did some backpacking, been camping quite a bit. And I'm here to tell you, a light at night, that flashlight or that lantern, doesn't illuminate the entire path. You can't see all the way down the path where you're headed. It only illuminates what's right in front of you. In order to see what lies ahead, we have to keep moving down the path. And it's kind of the same way with following God's will. As we exercise our trust in God by obeying Him and what He's already revealed to us, that's when He often shows us the next step we should take. So if you're having trouble discerning what your next step is, you know, ask yourself, have I already done what God has revealed to me to this point? So as the old song says, step by step, he leads me and I will follow him all the way home. Now, a lot of people have heard the amazing story of Helen Keller, a young woman from Alabama who lost both her sight and hearing before the age of two. And can you imagine living in a world of complete silence and complete darkness and the only interaction you're able to have with other people is through touch. Uh, thankfully, thanks to the efforts of a dedicated and creative teacher, Keller eventually learned to communicate through that sense of touch. And she not only went on to graduate from college, but she became a world famous author and lecturer. Now, according to the Western Recorder, shortly before her 60th birthday, Keller uh, expressed pity for those that she considered the real unseen. By this, she meant those who have eyes, but do not really see. Her 
long years of physical blindness had given her a spiritual insight, which enabled her to enjoy life in all of its fullness. And she once said, if the blind put their hand in God's, they find their way more surely than those who see but have no faith or purpose. Let me encourage you today, as you seek God's next step for your life, put your hand in God's. Trust in Him instead of your own understanding and walk with Him step by step each day through faith. Step by step, He leads me, and I will follow Him all the way home. If you want to know more about what it means to put your faith in Jesus, please reach out to us at pastor at newsalembaptist.net.